Welcome again. Uh, this is our uh, fourth uh, in, in the series of webinars exploring strategic issues concerning the long-term development of research libraries. We're very fortunate um, that uh, Cliff has, uh, is able to join us. He's joining us from, of all places, his office in Washington, D.C. I think, as many of you know, uh, Cliff uh, lives out in Berkeley and teaches at UC Berkeley and has many of his degrees from UC Berkeley, but we're very fortunate uh, that he comes to Washington with regularity, and he does, in fact, um, lead it. the Coalition for Network Information, has led it for, golly, it's almost 13 years now, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> and we're, um, we're uh, able to have this conversation with him today uh, that will range over a, a large number of issues, and we'll really, uh, the, the number of issues will be dictated by the fellows, in fact, because uh, Cliff has not put together a formal presentation for us, but instead will be open to your your questions and comments. And and I'd like to start with a, uh, a, a question about um, the Pew Internet study. But let, let, before I do that, let me just uh, check here on the technical uh, questions, make sure everybody is getting the video, everybody can hear, uh, if anybody's having trouble to, to give us uh, a signal uh, right away. I know some of us who, who came in on Firefox did not have as much success as we did with some of the other um, browsers. Any, any technical problems at the outset? Dwayne, this is Ann Snowman. I have both Firefox and IE open, and I all I'm getting is a please stand by message that indicates that the host has not started the session. Well, we're pretty sure he has started the session. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you might you might log out off the internet uh, and just log in fresh again. Okay, I did that. Uh, uh, but it, keep your telephone line open because you'll get the audio, uh, and what you'll miss will be the uh, the animated picture of Cliff in action in his Washington office. This is this is not, this is not often seen. He's more on the road than in the office. Yes, he's a, alive and well. He actually so the, one of the joys I, I must tell you, folks, one of the joys of working with Cliff is when he does fly in uh, to D.C. and he he comes. Uh, through the Washington offices, uh, he's he's always has this uh, capacity of dropping in uh, with a, a 20, 30 minute conversation and just uh, able to cover a, a wealth of uh, observations and developments in the field that uh, you think you you're, you've got your finger on the pulse and all of a sudden Cliff comes to town and makes sure it's it's reading the right uh, the right lines. It's amazing what knowledge and information he brings. He's, he's probably one of the most uh, traveled and uh, uh, engaged um, leaders in, in our community, and he, and he does this in both the, the library arenas and the IT arenas in an extraordinary uh, fashion, bringing to bear um, uh, the, his knowledge of, of current events and how he can translate that knowledge into a sense of trends and developments and, and key challenges, and then he moves those trends and developments and challenges into a, the context of helping us in the community um, connect into those developments in a constructive fashion. He's got a very, um, he's very knowledgeable, he's got a very positive view of the future for libraries and, and IT, and he's one of these um, extraordinary people who's got uh, uh, a very, um, a positive uh, philosophy in expressing that uh, future uh, to the different communities that we have to deal with. So I'm uh, I'm delighted that he's here and a part of our discussions today, and uh, welcome him uh, to this conversation. And and if I might start, uh, Cliff, by asking you to talk a little bit about the. Pew study. Well, that, uh, two things. First, uh, the list of e-messages that I sent out to um, 
the fellows. I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about uh, how you approach putting that list together of, of, of observations and, and also how they can connect onto it and, and, and how many people are involved with accessing that currently. And, and then if you'd go on and talk a little bit about the Pew study itself, um, uh, I, I find, the, um, I find the, the methodology of the Pew study fascinating, where they use those scenarios uh, that are conflicting uh, comments about uh, a particular issue uh, on into the future. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in your take on the conflicted scenarios they had regarding the future of reading. Uh, where you know almost a third of the of the respondents felt that the uh, uh, character and nature of reading and writing and understanding is going to deteriorate in this networked environment. A negative view of, of only a minority, of course, but a minority um, of experts who thought that way. But I thought, could you talk a little bit about your list and then uh, about the Pew study? Sure. I mean, let me let me just say by way of opening that I'm really delighted to be able to be with you today, and um, uh, you know I hope we'll have time for a fair number of questions and, and discussion. I really, um, after talking with the a bit, thought we'd just leave this kind of free form um, to do that. So um, one of the things that Dwayne shared with you as sort of background for this was just a collection of, I think, probably around five or six random recent postings off of the CNI Announce list. Um, CNI Announce is one of the major, is a, you know, classic old-fashioned email list. Um, and it's one of the major ways that we uh, keep in touch with um, our community. It's really used for three purposes. One is for what I characterize as kind of um, official CNI announcements. For example, um, uh, when we put out the agendas for our fall and spring meetings, or if we're having a workshop, or um, if uh, when the new program plan every year is ready, those kinds of business announcements, if you will, specific to CNI. Um, the second purpose is to share um, occasional announcements from allied organizations that we believe would be of interest to the CNI community. Um, so for ex example, um, we would put out uh, something like the um, call for papers or the registration stuff for something like the Joint Digital Libraries Conference, which we've been a supporter of for a number of years. And then the third um, function is really to inform people about um, reports, papers, and other kinds of material that um, is coming out that we would believe um, is a fairly specific and focused interest to people involved in CNI and that often has some connection to the um, to the CNI program plan or to specific sessions we've had at the CNI meetings over the years. Um, we try very hard to make available material that um, or pointers to material that people haven't seen elsewhere. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of reposting that goes on among lists, and while I'm happy to have CNI material reposted, um, I don't really want personally to um, bore people on CNI Announce with a lot of material they're already seeing from two or three other places. Uh, I also try, when possible, to add a little extra value to um, the materials I post by trying to connect them to other materials or place them in context or say a little bit about um, some of the um, some of the reasons why I think it's uh, particularly important to be tracking on things. Um, one of the things 
CNI is very lucky to have is some pretty good connections into the UK because of our, um, our, our long history of working closely with organizations like the UK Online Library Network and the Joint Information Systems Committee there. Um, and uh, they do a good, uh, a substantial amount of really good analytic work that is not widely seen in the U.S. So um, I also try and, um, where appropriate, um, make sure that people see some of that material as well. We've got about a thousand subscribers on CNI Announce now. It's a public list. We welcome everybody to subscribe. Um, I'd be delighted if you all subscribed, subscribe your friends, um, uh, redistribute material from it freely. Um, it really is just, you know, a way of getting the word out. And um, the easiest way to subscribe is just go to our homepage at uh, www.cni.org. There's a link right there that will get you to uh, a subscription to the list. Um, it's a tightly moderated list, so um, uh, you won't get a lot of spam on it, I hope. And um, typically, you know, a big week would be seven or eight messages. A uh, more typical week might be like one message. Uh, so that's a little about CNI announce. Um, let me move on, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me, um, uh, you know, if, uh, if there are further questions or you want to take this in some other direction. Um, let me move on to the Pew study. And this is an interesting beast. Um, I believe, if memory serves, this is now the fourth time that Pew has done this uh, survey on the future of the Internet. And what they do is they do this every couple of years. Um, so I think the first one was probably around 2001, 2002, if memory serves. They reach out to a lot of people with specific expertise in different areas. And, I mean, it's a, it's a big base of people, like hundreds, um, who are asked to comment on various propositions. They tried a kind of a new device this year, as, as Dwayne indicated, where they stake out some sort of extreme positions and see whether people will go for those as a, as a way of gaining additional insight into what's going on. And one of the areas they asked about was the future of reading. And, um, you know, this is a very interesting question that I hear a lot of speculation about. There is a school of thought um, that says that the web and more generally um, television also, uh, but especially the web, has changed the way people read and their expectations about reading and led them to a place where they have shorter attention spans, they're unwilling to read very lengthy things, they tend to read material kind of randomly and out of context a few paragraphs at a time, and they very much um, supplement textual material with um, audiovisual material uh, to a to a much greater extent than they did in the past. Um, there are also some related arguments that suggest um, that people's ability to com to comprehend um, complex, dense kind of textual arguments, the sort of thing you would see in um, the humanities, for example, at a university level, um, uh, in monographs, um, uh, has diminished. Um, there's certainly, you know, some reason to believe some of this is true. I'm, I'm enormously wary of, of great generalities in this area, and especially great generalities that are used to um, uh, thereby lead to pronouncements of the death of the book or the marginalization of the book. Um, clearly, there are still plenty of people reading books. Um, there are plenty of people reading lots of different genres of books. 
Um, I'm not sure that there really was a, you know, sort of halcyon old days where, um, uh, you know, a very significant part of the popula the adult population in the United States, in fact, read and understood large numbers of comprehensive monographs in the humanities. Um, I think that, you know, there's a tendency to always believe it used to be better than it was. Um, I think that while people may be doing less of that, they are at the same time perhaps more informed about other matters than they were in the past. Um, they hear a greater diversity of sampling of opinions. Um, uh, so I think we need to be very, very careful about um, generalities there. I think we also need to be mindful that um, we have a very poor understanding, relatively speaking, of the sort of arc of the history of reading and uh, of reading and culture. And it's really, you know, as far as I know, only been in the last 30 years, 20 years, that this has become a substantial focus of multidisciplinary academic research. Um, so there's, you know, there's fascinating research going on now about the reading practices in Victorian England, in Elizabethan England, in France um, in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, the growth of literacy, what people did with that literacy, um, what kind of, uh, you know, genres of material the general population read and how often um, the number of works that typical people were familiar with. We really don't know that much about this. And the, the, the you know, kind of history of reading and, and its relation to culture has historically been dominated, I think, by a very small number, relatively speaking, of intellectuals in kind of an anecdotal way. Um, uh, now the, Now people are trying to get a much more kind of holistic view of, of that, and um, it's turning out to be very, very complicated. Um, you can ask questions, of course, about what does this mean for research libraries today and tomorrow, and particularly research libraries embedded in universities. Um, I think that certainly for Serious research, the monograph still has a significant place and is going to have a significant place. Um, textual arguments are going to continue to have a significant place. Um, scholars working in the humanities and social sciences um, are going to need to be able to work with and comprehend and consult a substantial history of textually based arguments that have been made by the scholars that have preceded them across the centuries. Um, in the sciences and mathematics, of course, uh, you know, arguments are still textual, but they're, they're more compact in various ways, and we can talk about, you know, that, that sort of thing a little separately, because I think it is a little bit separate and has its sort of own unique character. Um, I do think, though, that looking in the other direction, um, uh, when you think about the role of, um, of research libraries in capturing and organizing and preserving cultural materials as objects of study for future scholars. So when we think about um, scholars uh, 20 years from now trying to understand um, the kinds of questions I was talking about about reading uh, in um, you know America in 2005, um, we've got to recognize that um, uh, reading is only one source and perhaps a diminishing source of information for um, a significant part of the population. Um, I just, I mean, I could go on about this for a long time, and I don't want to spend all our time on this, but I'll, I'll just kind of make a couple of, of um, other comments. One is I think it's important not to confuse um, illiteracy with not reading very much. Um, there are 
a certain percentage of people who I've heard characterized as sort of functionally illiterate. And um, I'm skeptical of some of the numbers, but the way I've heard this characterized is, you know, they can't read instructions on forms, they can't read menus, they can't read, you know, transit directions, things like that. Um, uh, there's a far cry between that and people who can read just fine and read all the things I described just fine, but aren't particularly interested, for example, in reading novels. Um, there are many of us, and I'm certainly one of them, who um, really enjoy reading fiction of various kinds for pleasure. And, you know, I probably go through 100, 200 books a year of this kind of material um, in a good year. Um, there are other people who just aren't interested in that. Um, doesn't make them illiterate, it just means that's a form of entertainment they're not interested in. And we've seen new forms of, um, uh, of media arise that compete with the novel. Um, certainly in the 20th century, we saw the rise first of radio and then of film and then of television as competitors for people's time and attention. And it's very striking, although um, often unrecognized, I think, how much Video games, for example, have emerged as a really serious contender for um, people's attention and mind share uh, in the very late 20th and very early 21st century. Um, there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time and a lot of money, by the way, playing video games. And the, the size of that industry is now up there getting competitive um, with the film industry. So uh, there's some very interesting things going on there. Um, the second thing I would just say is um, whenever you read surveys about the present and future of reading, um, read the footnotes and be very cautious. There is a particularly, um, uh, to my mind, sort of notorious set of surveys that the National Endowment for the Arts, I believe it is, um, has comes out with every couple of years where they um, generally accompany this with massive, with, with sort of massive and hysterical pre press releases about the decline of culture. And, you know, they ask very strange things in there, like um, uh, that are very judgmental. For example, they're very interested in how often people go to the opera. The closest thing they get to people engaging with, um, shall we say, more popular forms of live music is, the, I believe, they ask about um, uh, live jazz performances. And jazz, uh, while it is, on the one hand, you know, classified still as a relatively popularist form of music as opposed to opera, is also a very marginalized form of music, which doesn't sell records very much and which only a pretty minuscule part of the population is interested in. They choose not to ask about a number of the other um, popular genres. So, um, you know, you ask the right you, you ask the right questions, you get the answers that suit yourself. Um, so those those are just a few thoughts about the future of, of reading and, and where it fits in things. That's an excellent start, uh, Cliff. Uh, very <laughs> thoughtful. Uh, off the, off the, I don't know how you do it off the top of your head, but that's a very thoughtful uh, set of comments. So let me just throw it out to our uh, community of, of fellows and, and see uh, if there's anybody who would like to chime in with a, uh, a question or a comment for Cliff to work with. is a test. <laughs> is there anybody out there? Yes. Yeah. I have a question, Cliff. It's Chris Ives at UBC. Um, I'm wondering what you think will be the impact of a, an increasingly post-literate society on the functions of a research library. How is it going to change what we're going to do five, ten years out? Well, um, 
you know, I don't think we can predict all sides of it, but I'm absolutely convinced that um, we better get a whole lot more serious about um, dealing with still images and moving images mm -hmm. as first-rate pieces of material. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples that are particularly striking to me. Um, for those of you um, in the sciences, you're probably familiar with a particularly dreadful part of the genre of um, classic scientific articles called the method section, um, which allegedly is the kind of information on how you gathered the data or did the experiment and, um, you know, is, is sort of widely recognized as generally being quite unsatisfactory for people who really want to understand how you did the experiment or reproduce the experiment, which is um, why historically um, people who really wanted to, say, pick up on the experiment, line of experimentation that was done on one lab in another lab would often physically go and visit um, the first lab to observe firsthand how they did it and talk to the people. Um, now you're finding that a combination of video of how experiments are being done and perhaps in some cases also um, uh, some blog information um, or commentary on that video um, are largely supplanting traditional method sections. Um, and sometimes they're being um, attached to articles as supplementary materials, but in many other cases they just have a kind of an independent life as, you know, YouTube videos or other things that wander around the place. Um, these are really important uh, to the extent that um, uh, people want to convey cutting-edge science, scientific practice from one, um, one group of scientists to the next. Um, to give you just um, maybe a couple more examples, um, one of the things I've been spending a bit of time on over the past year or so is, actually more like the past four or five years, is thinking about as the records of individuals' lives change, what happens to special collections? Mm -hmm. One of the backbones of special collections historically has been um, these, um, these collections of um, the papers of prominent individuals, be they political figures, intellectual figures, artistic figures, business figures, but people who, you know, played an important role in, in something and gave their personal papers to an archive or to a, a library special collection. And as most of you know, um, uh, you know, gave was the good old days. Now there's often a brisk market in this and you see, um, you know, Emory acquiring the papers of uh, Solomon Rushdie and um, who was it? Uh, was it UCLA that got Susan Sontag? Um, uh, other, others of these kinds of figures, you know, selling their papers for six or seven figures to an archive. Now, what happens, of course, is that as the nature of, as, as the nature of how people go through life changes, what's in those personal archives and collections also changes. So, um, Today, as folks acquire these collections, they're already seeing the impact of more and more digital stuff. They're finding these collections include sort of nasty capsule histories of the consumer media of the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. Um, in many cases, deteriorating rapidly and uh, where it's very hard to find hardware and software to play it. They're finding whole computers in these collections. Um, apparently, uh, there are some authors, amusingly, that sort of, um, every time they start a new book, they get a new computer. 
And then as they finish one book and move on to the next, they put the old computer in the closet. Hmm. So as they if they need to go back to their notes or manuscripts for, you know, an older book, they go and try and reboot the computer out of the closet, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so um, you've got these kinds of things. You're now finding that people have significant masses of electronic mail. Um, actually, what we're seeing, though, is what's going into special collections and archives is still a bit of a rearview mirror kind of effect. If you look at people today, their digital presence, depending on who they are and what they're doing, may be scattered around not just among a collection of email housed on their personal machines, but stuff in Google Docs and Gmail, uh, Facebook pages, um, all kinds of services out in the cloud, Flickr streams for their images. Um, we also see as a related matter that people um, in the last uh, five or so years, as camera phones have proliferated and cheap digital cameras have proliferated, are taking orders of magnitude more photographs than the previous generation because they're really cheap to take. Um, all of this stuff is going to turn up in the special collections of the future, and I think um, uh, it is past time for us to get really serious about how we're going to manage and organize it pragmatically. Um, so, so those are some of the places where I think we'll see a serious impact. Um, maybe just to mention one more, it's already abundantly clear that image collections are going to be much more important in teaching and research. Um, uh, librarians I talk to, not just at research libraries, but academic libraries of all types, are finding more and more demand from faculty and from students for images to support teaching and to support research work. Um, and indeed, images, if you will, to support just kind of communication, because Communication now is not just a process of writing text. Um, you want collections of images that you can embed in PowerPoint decks and things like that if you're using those. So um, uh, we see a great demand for um, various kinds of image collections to be used. Other questions or comments from uh, the community? Yeah, uh, hi, this is Brian. Hi, Brian. Uh, so the uh, I, I hear what you're saying, <clears throat> and uh, it, it, I, I find it to be a little bit uh, unsettling in terms of what the, what the capacity of, of libraries is going to be. So we've got to come up with new ways to collaborate with one another and with uh, academic units and, and, and with others outside the academy, I'm, I'm assuming, but how how can um, how are we going to how are we going to do this? Uh, we still have to continue doing some of what we have been doing uh, with text, but uh, you know I'm 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 thinking about the the question of, a, of what constitutes an author's papers. Well, uh, in the past, you know, an author's papers may or may not have been complete. They may or may not have been scattered across different locations. Uh, a correspondent shows up a generation later, uh, and and you, you discover that you've got you've got more to deal with. Um, maybe that's going to happen with the the electronic media that document an individual's uh, life. But um, do, you, do you can you can you address at all the kinds of collaborations that that we will need to forge or or how we will how we will decide as research libraries which which aspects of all of this documentation we actually can uh, uh, collect and uh, and provide access to. Um, I can't answer that question completely. I mean, in, in the first place, it's a huge question um, with many many ramifications, and secondly, I think there are. 
things that are going to happen that we don't even understand yet and new possibilities that will open up. But let me comment on a couple of kind of specific aspects of this um, that might at least get people's, you know, uh, ideas flowing. So on the, on the personal papers, and we'll use the term papers in a very, you know, generic and broad sense, I think there are a couple of things. Um, there's no question that material will continue to come to light um, uh, just as it has in the past, um, long after people are gone, um, and that the collections that um, libraries and archives acquire will perforce be incomplete in various ways. Um, but I'll just make a couple points. The materials are much more at risk in some ways today than they were in the past because, um, you know, things like Facebook pages or um, Gmail collections and things like that can go away very fast um, after people die off. Um, or you can have terrific problems accessing them if they don't leave a comprehensive set of passwords in their will. Um, you know, it's sort of a an early harbinger of, of what people are facing um, is showing up now as you look at some of these um, cases where um, uh, people die early and unexpectedly, for example, um, uh, soldiers in some cases, and their parents want to get at some of their sort of digital trails to preserve it and share it with people and things like that. And that's become a very contentious area. So uh, legally, um, so I think that we may see very, con very different kinds of relationships between institutions and individuals who might be sources of these materials. It may be much more important to connect with them when they're alive than with mm -hmm. their estates. It may actually be important to intervene with them and help them with questions about information management and backups and organization while they are still in their working lives. And I know a few libraries who are starting to dabble in that area, and it's very interesting. Um, it's also fraught with questions about how do you decide where to place your bets. Um, there is some good news as well as bad news in the case of what do you do with these collections once you take them in. As you well know, um, our special collections and archives are full of poorly described and largely opaque collections, you know, where you just have a collection level record, um, personal papers of um, Joe Smith, 19. 22 through 1980, 19 boxes, um, and, uh, you know, we live in hope that someone, either a, a curator or a scholar, will come and uh, sort through this at some point and develop some navigational aids and some better inventory. Um, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, and sometimes um, uh, organizations are able to take advantage of things like the Mellon Hidden Collection grants through CLEAR to get some traction on this material. But in the future, as this is in more and more in digital form, um, it may not be perfect, but um, it's very cheap, relatively speaking, to provide some brute force full text search. It's relatively cheap, um, technically speaking, to exploit um, uh, metadata that comes with images today, um, which includes things like when were they taken and where were they taken. If you've got some kind of, um, of GPS or other um, geospatial locating apparatus in the camera, which is becoming commonplace. So um, you will get a bit more organization of these digital files practically for free, um, uh, which will help a little bit. Um, let me turn from there to one other case study, which I think is very provocative, though, um, and that's images. 
So we talked a little bit about how images are becoming really important in all kinds of contexts of teaching, learning, communication, reference. Um, one of the horrible things about images right now is every institution tends to treat them as one-off. So to the extent that we invest in describing images, there's still a very strong tendency for everybody to do original cataloging of them. What we really, I think, need to move towards, and there are systems like ArtStore, which represent, I think, an important um, set of initial moves in this direction, is towards sort of canonical image collections, sizable ones that are pretty well described, um, but that each institution doesn't have to describe locally, um, uh, which can be used to, to at least satisfy some of the needs for images. I mean, this is not going to solve the problem, but it will help some. I think that we also need um, uh, much better collective description systems for images. Um, photo, uh, things like Flickr and Flickr Commons um, tagging systems are a helpful start there. Um, I think that we're going to see images tied not just to tagging but to narrative kind of description in a more extended way. Um, and the role of libraries, archives, and museums in managing that process is going to become a significant part of what they do in some cases. Uh, but um, I, I think that we really need to um, we need to start thinking about what can we do pragmatically to improve the situation um, for um, access to images and use of images in ways that is that are um, financially realistic and pragmatic and not just sort of look at this and say this is this is a problem so unmanageable we truly don't know what to do. Um, when we look at um, at video uh, again, I think um, uh, we need to apply some of that kind of thinking. We also need to recognize that doing things like um, uh, spoken word to text transcription and then indexing on that text may be um, an example of the sort of ugly uh, but practical way to get at least a bit of leverage in this area. So those are those are you know a few places where I, I'd be um, I'd be thinking a bit. Good. Th thank you, Cliff. There, there was an article in the paper, the Washington Post this morning, Cliff, uh, about uh, universities, uh, faculty at some universities, uh, uh, preventing the use of computers in the classroom because of the enormous distractions uh, that it provides. Did you see that article today? Um, I didn't, but I've certainly had an earful on this topic from various people in recent years, including some of the poor network engineers who have been undertaking to do, to do, you know, ubiquitous wireless access across campuses, and then encountered faculty demands that insist that um, you be able to turn off the wireless classroom by classroom. Yes, exactly. That's what if you know anything about radio engineering, um, that is just an unbelievable nightmare. Because <laughs> radio propagation doesn't go classroom by classroom. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have kind of a problem with this. Uh, I can understand in some cases a faculty member, for example, saying, I'd like to do a closed book quiz, and I'd like it to be not just closed book, but closed computer, so I'd like you all to put all this stuff down, because um, I just want to take kind of a fast not snapshot of, you know, where you are in learning this material. But um, by and large, I get very, and, you know, I'm, I may be very old school here, 
Um, I get very uncomfortable with faculty who want to um, restrict what I'd classify as non-disruptive um, activities in the classroom. So, um, you know, I can understand why you would want as a faculty member to say, I don't want people talking on their cell phones in the class. It's disruptive. But if they want to look around on the web and follow what we're doing or answer their mail or, you know, anything else, um, I don't see why not as a rule. Um, it, it seems to me like you've got to ask people to take responsibility for um, for their own actions and their own learning. And, um, by the way, not personalize the fact that they may – at a given moment, be more interested in surfing than listening to you. <laughs> um, I'll, but I, as I say, I'm very old school in this area, and I'll, I'll go a little off topic and tell everybody a story that um, has raised a lot of red flags for me recently um, in terms of a um, information policy problem that I think is going to blow up sometime soon on campuses. So um, you've got, uh, of course, these learning management systems that are widely used in campuses now, and they collect a ton of data. Um, they collect data about how often people use them. Um, often they have attendance modules that can be linked into them so the uh, faculty member in charge of a class can be taking attendance, gradebook modules. They may have exercises online that if they're multiple choice are automatically graded. They can keep track of how much time students are spending um, in uh, um, chat conversations or things like that around um, topics related to the class. So they collect a ton of data. Okay, put that aside for a moment. Now, one of the things if you go and you talk to the presidential associations uh, for higher ed and the kinds of things that they're talking to the Department of Education about, um, two of the very big um, uh, uh, buzzwords this year are retention and completion. Essentially, um, the top-level policymakers at universities, the regents, trustees, the president, the provost, have become very concerned with how well the university is doing in terms of retaining the students it admits and seeing them make their way through to completion of degree. And these have become um, important parameters in judging the effect of higher the, the effectiveness of higher education systems and the return on investment that, for example, states are getting for what they uh, pump into supporting their state higher education systems at various levels from community colleges on up. Perfectly reasonable stuff and sounds like a, a fine idea to um, focus on these things, um, to recognize that really delivering on the promise of access to higher education means not just that people need to get there, but they need to get through in some meaningful way. Okay, so at the recent EDUCAUSE meetings, I'm starting to hear talks that basically are about how do you data mine the material in your student record systems and in your learning management systems so that you can present faculty in charge of classes with alerts every week or at whatever the appropriate interval is saying you have students in your class and here are the students who are starting to conform to the pattern of people who fail this class or will drop out of the class. Now, on the one hand, this is being framed as a very effective potential measure for trying to do early interventions for students who are having trouble with completion, with, re with uh, retention. Um, students who are at risk. And so they're arguing that 
this is a this is exactly the sort of thing we should be doing, applying information technology in an intelligent way to advance the policy objectives of the higher education institutions. At the same time, uh, I find this deeply creepy on two counts. Count one is um, we are giving the students no transparency about what data is being collected, who gets to use it, how long it's retained, what purposes it might be put to. And the sort of notion of having your teacher come over and say, I need to counsel you. Um, I'm seeing some statistical predictors that you're headed for failure um, as extremely disconcerting. It's a, it's a bit like that, um, that movie that was made uh, from the Philip uh, K. Dick story um, uh, a couple years ago um, where they can predict people who are going to be criminals and deal with them before they actually become criminals. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece of it, though, that I find troublesome on a different level is that one of the things that I always thought higher education was about is getting people to take charge of their own learning and to develop some discipline about learning and about managing that. Uh, I can remember vividly um, having some very valuable learning experiences as an undergraduate where, um, you know, I was being told uh, by various uh, faculty members that I was responsible for learning the material um, and that there would be an exam at the end of the course to see whether I did and that if coming to class was helpful, I should come to class and that if it wasn't, I shouldn't and that um, I was going to be uh, judged on mastery of material that included re readings that weren't necessarily covered in class. Um, and that, uh, you know, part of what I was expected to do was um, to learn how to do that. And that feels to me like a very, very um, distant reach from this sort of, uh, you know, panoptic learning management system um, telling you that uh, because you didn't log enough minutes online last week, you're in danger of failure and you're going to get counseled. Uh, so, um, you know, I do, I do wonder about some of these kinds of things. Interesting. That, that is provocative. And I can see uh, the, the concern on the part of uh, the parent as a uh, consumer and wanting to know uh, if their uh, their youngster, which they've been paying a lot of attention to, is, is suddenly uh, uh, working his or her way toward trouble uh, academically, or or uh, in in terms of some of the disasters that have happened on campus, if there are developments in the mental health or the uh, physical well-being of the student. Again, this this all relates that the question of how, to, how is information about uh, student behavior being managed on campus. But it is a very complex issue, and frankly, this is one where um, if you can get their attention um, before Paul Peters, my pre the late Paul Peters, my predecessor at CNI, used to speak back in the early 90s about a phenomenon called when the net hits the fan. <laughs> and basically that was his shorthand for something blowing up in the press and causing a lot of very hasty and awkward decisions because an institution was too lazy or um, too short-sighted to recognize that it should be putting policies in place um, uh, to deal with the digital world. And this is one of these areas where I do think the net is going to hit the fan, as it were. And I think that your colleagues in IT and instructional technology who are managing, in many cases, these learning management systems could learn a whole lot from their library colleagues about at least having some clear and transparent policies about privacy and data collection. 
um, you, you know, you can argue who should be able to use this data and what should be collected from several points of view. But I think it's very hard to argue against making those policy decisions transparent to the students. Mm -hmm. comments or, other comments or questions from the community? I'll try and be less long-winded on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me let me jump in for to give people a, a, a moment to think. Talk a little bit about the upcoming CNI um, uh, task force meeting in Baltimore. Who have you got in line for us, and uh, uh, what does it, what's the program looking like? Um, well, uh, just as a little quick background on that. Um, we do two meetings a year, um, and uh, our member institutions typically send two folks to it. Uh, usually the um, head of the library or um, their representative and the CIO or their representative. Um, and these run about two days. There are, there are, we do a couple plenary sessions, a whole lot of parallel breakouts, and the breakouts are a mix of sessions proposed by the CNI member community and some invited sessions that uh, Joan Lippincott and I um, uh, develop where we want to bring developments from the outside world to the attention of the CNI community. So, um, so that, that's kind of the general format of the meeting. Our next one is in Baltimore in mid-April. We're going to open with a um, with a panel session, which I'm going to moderate, which is going to look at the implementation of open access mandates. So, in other words, the point here is not are open access mandates good or bad, or how do you persuade your academic senate to pass one, or whether government agencies should put them in place or not. But it's, the focus of this session is rather they are going into place. Um, the NIH has one in place. The Wellcome Trust has one in place. Um, we are starting to see faculty senates put these in place. Um, so um, institutions are having to deal with them. Now, after, after the press releases are over, what's happening? Who actually deals with it and how? Where's the organizational responsibility situated? How do you measure compliance? What do you do about compliance? Um, who looks at that? How do you fund these activities? So um, we're going to have a we're going to have a um, a session which is going to take a close look at some of this. Um, the closing plenary is. Um, going to be by Liz Lyon, who is a, the director of um, the UK uh, Online Library Network. She's actually a uh, biologist by training, um, and um, she's going to talk about some developments in open science, citizen science, and e-science. Um, she did a very good report last, um, I guess it was last December. Um, uh, called uh, Science at Web Scale, which gets into some of these issues, and she's going to use that as a point of departure. I think there's some terribly interesting stuff that's going on there, um, uh, not the least of which is this sort of reemergence of citizen science um, and how this connects up to sort of mainstream legitimate academic science. And you're seeing these links forged in all kinds of areas around um, biodiversity and um, uh, observational biology, um, geology, ecology, um, uh, astronomy. Um, many of these are fields with a large observational component. And um, uh, you're also starting to see analytic work being done if you look at um, programs like Galaxy Zoo, for example. Um, I believe, although I don't think Liz is going to get into this, incidentally, that you, if you look at another set of developments, right, you can trace in the emergence of 
a renewed and very large-scale interest in genealogy, local history and family history, and related things, um, uh, a, a sort of a parallel process, which I've actually started referring to as citizen humanities. Um, and I think there's some very interesting parallels to be seen there. But anyway, those are the two kind of, um, of um, you know, bookend um, uh, plenary sessions. We've got about 38 breakout sessions, and I'm not going to take you through all of them. Um, they're really a wide range of things, but um, they uh, we should have the list up online, if not already, within the next day or two. We just finaled off the list early this week. Um, and, um, you know, I'm happy to go through a few selected breakouts with you if you like. I'm going to actually be leading one myself on um, some of these issues around uh, personal archives in the digital world that we um, touched on a little earlier. We're going to have one about um, uh, um, architectural reconstructions of um, uh, Knossos and Crete um, uh, using digital technology. Uh, we're going to have some discussions uh, dealing with how we move um, pricing models for scholarly serials, uh, several things on learning spaces and the use of instructional technologies. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just sort of throwing out a few here to give you a sense of the um, of the breadth of the breakout sessions that we do. Uh, so those those are a few of the ones that I can think of just off the top of my head. Um, as I say, um, uh, um, we should have the full full list with abstracts up very shortly if it is not on our site already. April is going to be a busy month uh, for the fellows. They've got your meeting. They've got the uh, ARL meeting. Uh, they have also have a session out in Dublin uh, with OCLC. And I'm wondering if uh, you might take a, a moment to comment on OCLC in relationship to our um, title for this conversation. Of, uh, where does OCLC fit into reconceiving library roles in the um, digital environment of tomorrow? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, um, one of the sort of themes that, uh, you know, really Lark and Dempsey there um, uh, framed very nicely was this idea of moving activity from the local level to the network level. And, you know, that's – that. Doing that for descriptive cataloging uh, of books has been one of the sort of great themes of what OCLC has been about for, ever since Fred Kilgore founded it. Um, and it's been a tremendous achievement that has, um, you know, paid off, I think, financially for the library community uh, very well and also allowed um, – uh, a lot of enhanced services like much much more efficient uh, interlibrary loan than we had 30 years ago. Uh, right now, I think they're doing some very interesting work um, with um, taking what have been traditionally local systems to a, a network level with this uh, local WorldCat thing. And of course, they're not without competition in that area, both from the traditional ILS vendors and some new offerings. I think they uh, have a very tricky path ahead of them as they move deeper into that area um, but don't but need to make room for a diversity of solutions there. Um, I think that there's some very interesting questions about how they move from descriptive cataloging of books to roles in describing other kinds of material and also hosting digitized material, and that's something that's very interesting to think about. Um, the other place I've been grappling with OCLC quite a lot is um, I've had the, um, I'm not sure I want to say privilege, um, uh, but I have been serving on this committee to try and come up with a 
new um, usage policy for OCLC records that kind of reflects the reality of the networked environment and the various things that we need to be able to do with those records as a community, but also recognizes that those records will be valuable only as long as OCLC as OCLC's database as a comprehensive and up-to-date and high-quality representation of the collective bibliographic holding um, uh, continues to have those properties. And I have to say that, um, uh, you know, trying to work through the complexities of this with my colleagues on that committee has been an enormously challenging uh, effort that really, you know, on occasion has left me after those conference calls uh, ready for some aspirin. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that um, there will be uh, – inevitably unhappiness with whatever that committee comes up with because the balances and the compromises are just incredibly complicated here. Which committee is that? This is the um, committee uh, on the new record use policy. Okay. I, actually, I guess technically I'm not sure whether it's a committee or a task force, but it will make recommendations to the OCLC board and management later this year. Okay. It's Catherine, I have a, a question related to another report that Dwayne pointed us to, was, okay. uh, which is the Sustainable Economics for a Digital Planet. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I'm sure there are thousands and thousands of questions, and the one um, that that stuck with me, which is probably too large for any real answer, but I'd like your thoughts on it, is the thrust, the importance of private public partnerships in order to sustain the digital future. And in the emphasis that public policy and very real incentives will be required um, to build a sustainable future. So I guess if there is a question, it's how can libraries foster positive partnerships with the private sector in a way, you know, when, when we're often at loggerheads, especially when it comes to public policy? Um, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, um, I'm probably speaking just a little bit out of school here as a member of that committee. Mm -hmm. um, that. The wording on that was somewhat controversial, and the point on it was somewhat controversial. I mean, it's one of these things that it's hard to disagree with at a very high level, but right. when you get practical about it um, and say, yeah, and what specifically do you want to do, um, it gets very hard. Um, the um, you need to understand that that committee actually included um, people, for example, representing Hollywood. And um, okay. if you look at the history of NDIP, for example, uh, at the Library of Congress and its partners, you know, one of the big ideas there as well was to engage um, public-private partners um, in preservation. But it really didn't work out terribly well in NDIP because, you know, as you reached out, for example, to the movie industry, you sort of got these things saying, well, if you'd like to spend $10 million, you know, building a backup facility for us um, with the understanding that nobody ever, ever can see that material, um, sure, <laughs> go ahead. Um, we, we had trouble um, identifying the um, – the kind of um, points of compromise for some of the very high value material in any. Right. Um, that, that report, you know, actually looks across a number of scenarios, and I think there probably are places where we can structure some, some things. One of the things I'm very struck by is um, because of the duration of copyright, often things exhaust their commercial value before they exhaust their copyright. Mm -hmm. And if we can set up some incentives for good handoffs, 
and maybe some punishments too for bad handoffs um, because um, you know I'm not sure just incentives work here um, uh, and incentives to me sometimes are like tax incentives and things like that which um, you know I, I'm I'm not sure how much we should be giving away but mm -hmm. um, if we can do things to avoid works getting orphaned if we can do things to try and encourage people who produce material to pass copies of it off to the um, cultural memory sector, I think that's very desirable. Um, there, are, there are a few other places I can imagine incentives that would be interesting, and I'm not sure they're the ones that that committee was thinking about. But um, let, let me toss out an idea, for example, that I've been considering uh, for a bit. There's a tremendous amount of cultural material, manuscripts, um, paintings, sculpture, other kinds of things that are in the hands of private collectors. There's nothing wrong with that per se at all. but there is some public interest in trying to get that material more into the public space. And there's a history, for example, of private collectors working together with museums where they will make paintings or objects that they own available for a specific exhibition at a museum. Or they'll make images of it available for a, um, a catalog raison of an artist, uh, things like that. Um, in some countries, particularly in Europe, have gone farther. Um, for example, in the UK, if you are a collector and you want to sell a art object in your possession that meets certain criteria, um, you're welcome to do it. But um, UK public cultural institutions actually have a window, I think it's three months or six months, where they can match the best bid and essentially buy it into the UK public domain instead of um, letting it go offshore to probably to another private collector. Um, that's a very interesting arrangement. Now, recognize that with the technology we've got now to do digitization, we can actually capture images of various kinds of cultural materials, which if not entirely substitutable for the originals, are certainly substitutable for a wide range of scholarly purposes. Mm -hmm. So why can't we think of ways to encourage collectors to let public institutions take digital representations of the collections they hold and maybe give a digital representation back to the collector as well for free, um, but at least make that digital representation part of the public holdings. Um, if we could do that, if we could structure tax incentives or insurance incentives or other kinds of, of arrangements to do that, I think that's a fabulous opportunity. And I wonder, uh, you know, again, whether there aren't things we can do in that area in preservation as well. Um, so I, I think that was a very kind of open-ended suggestion in there and um, you know some of us suggested in, in specifics there the word tax incentives for instance um, some of the economists were completely flipped out about that and um, <laughs> really didn't want to be that specific and wanted to speak of incentives more generally um, you know maybe there are ways we can come up with um, uh, you know incentives in the form of, of you know, good public relations or something. Uh, it's something we need to talk about because it's very clear to me that um, even if we start getting very aggressive about enforcing um, um, uh, copyright deposit um, laws and regulations, that um, it's going to be very, very difficult to preserve 
a lot of um, cultural materials, particularly, without some level of relatively active um, uh, cooperation from the uh, from the rights holders on this stuff. Thank did, you. Did that help? Yes. Thank you very much. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Cliff, could you uh, – one of the things that I've lost touch with in my uh, retired role here is is the uh, – is the progress, the success of the Mellon uh, investment in special collections that's been uh, the project uh, that the Council on the Library and Information Resources is handling for them. How is that coming along? The, this is the so-called Hidden Collections um, uh, program. Um, and actually, uh, you know, Duane probably is too uh, modest to admit it, but um, it, this really has its roots in a um, program that he orchestrated when he was director of ARL at the, the that was done jointly with the Library of Congress about opening up hidden collections and about the sort of scope of the hidden collections problem. And um, you know, it actually is a beautiful object lesson. Um, in how long it can really take to deal with some of these because if I remember right, Dwayne, you did that meeting probably in about 2004. Well, you, you've got better recall than I do. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't even come up with that number. Uh, you, we can look it up on the ARL website, but it was some time ago. And this produced a very helpful set of proceedings. It actually kicked off a really invigor reinvigorated um, focus on special collections as key resources within ARL. They um, chartered a special collections task force that really built from there. And, uh, you know, that in turn gave rise to the joint um, ARL-CNI symposium on the future of special collections that uh, was done in conjunction with the ARL meeting last October. Um, but, um, you know, another real outcome of, of the framing of this problem back in the, let's say, mid-2000s was that um, uh, CLEAR, under Chuck Henry's leadership, developed a proposal to Mellon where Mellon would give clear about, I think it's about five million a year, at least for two years, um, which clear would regrant through a, um, through a program it would manage to institutions that wanted to use it to describe hidden collections. And um, they've given out, I believe, um, over a hundred grants under this program. Um, uh, they've certainly had huge numbers of applicants. One of the things that I think has been very helpful is that while the applicants and the successful grantees have included um, ARL institutions, they've gone well beyond ARL institutions and reached out to a wide range of uh, smaller archives and museums and historical uh, societies as well as um, as well as the really big research libraries, um, thereby you know kind of emphasizing that um, special collections and the problem of hidden special collections was really um, you know much more widespread uh, than than simply a hand, a relative handful of a hundred or a hundred and fifty major research libraries. So I think it's been quite successful. I don't know, honestly, whether Mellon is going to fund this for another year or not. I've not talked with, um, with Chuck Henry about it recently. Uh, but I'd have to count this as quite a success. If there's anything I would say I wish could have been done better about it, I would have loved to see it um, linked more tightly to a um, – to an additional funding program out of either IMLS 
or perhaps the National Endowment for the Humanities, which would deal with a program of digitizing some of the special collections in parallel with their opening up through descriptive, the creation of descriptive tools. Um, uh, because I think as many of these collections become more visible, you'll see an immediate demand for, wow, this is really good stuff. We need to get it digitized. And there would have, I think, been some um, uh, workflow economies um, if both processes had been pursued in parallel. Interesting. Certainly it's... Uh it's an, a strategic effort on the part of the ARL that has been longstanding and uh, uh, very, uh, very much committed to. And I, and I think you're, you're right to point out with, that we've had some success with it. Okay. Um, but I think it's also really interesting to recognize, and I think you know, there's an important kind of lesson here for um, for some of the the fellows, perhaps, about the time scale of these things. This, this program, really, if you look at the things that led to it all the way through to the completion of many of these grants, is really something that had to be conceived of as, as you know, really taking most of a decade. Um, you really need, when you look at these kind of, um, you know, major structural um, challenges in uh, the collection of, um, of research library collections nationally and internationally, um, these, are, these are challenges that have to be thought about on the time scale of, you know, a decade, not a year. Well, that, that, you know, that's right. And, of course, uh, ARL has had a, a longstanding interest in, uh, in special collections, but, but you're, you're right with, with the, with the um, uh, moving into the uh, digital environment, the um, you know how exactly we we present those, how we illustrate them, how do we get them out and well known and and uh, communicate them to our communities is is uh, is a very it's a it's a collective problem, a collective challenge. Mm -hmm. We're we're coming up uh, we, to the end of the. Um, the discussion. Let me just pause to see if there's anybody who wants to get one last question in before I go to closure. It's Catherine Steve. Um, the other report that really captured me, and you said you're hosting a panel at the CNI meeting about this, is the, the Personal Digital Archives with a Digital Live Project. Yes. I mean, that's absolutely fascinating, and the implications go on and on forever. Um, but the one that you mentioned earlier, and maybe this is one way to make a specific question, is that you know of some libraries that are actually working with living creators <laughs> um, and starting to curate, uh, I guess, their personal archives now. Um, can you maybe speak to that a little bit more about what that might look like in practice and what the implications are for special collections and research libraries? Because I think it must be key to making this work. It, it is, and um, or I think it will be. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll, uh, let me just make a couple of observations here, and recognize that to some extent, I'm I, I'm going on you know anecdote and observation, um, mm -hmm. and I don't really have systematic data to back up a lot of this. Um, it seems fairly clear that. Um, the, the wise curator um, is, you know, reaching out to uh, various people and families when they'd like to acquire their papers. Um, you know, you're not sort of waiting for them to die out. You want to get a little out in front of that. And particularly if you have a relationship of some kind between an important figure and an institution, um, uh, you know, you're, you're well positioned for this kind of discussion. Um, uh, there are a few institutions that I would say are, are historically are just masters of this. Um, New York Public, the research libraries at New York Public comes to mind, for example, as, as one that has been, um, uh, very, very, um, 
smart in exploiting its links to the flourishing um, uh, creative and intellectual communities in New York City. Um, but there are others, surely. Um, but one of the questions is how early in people's career do you do that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, by the time people are in their 40s, let's say, certainly early 50s, um, often it's pretty clear that they've racked up a, a, a sufficient set of achievements to, um, you know, that they're going to um, they're going to be regarded as significant figures. Um, it's much harder to call that in the, their 20s. Um, I know of at least one place, um, and it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a cheat, but it's provocative. Um, I had a very interesting conversation last year with some uh, folks from the National Library of Wales. <clears throat> now, the Welsh National Library, you know, has as its mission primarily um, the the literature um, in the Welsh language. Uh, you know, which is kind of a nicely scoped thing. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, you know, there's not really all that much of it at some level. Um, they face a problem of kind of a different scale than, um, than they might at, say, the Library of Congress here. Um, so they actually tell me that they're reaching out to even rather young authors who are writing literature in Welsh, and they're actually reaching out to them in ways where they're talking with them about backup and about um, saving copies of manuscripts at various points of revision, and perhaps even saying, um, well, you know, we'd be happy to serve as one of your off-site backups with the understanding that you're depositing things with us, and, you know, if you need a backup copy back, we'll give you one. Um, uh, that's very interesting to me, and, um, you know, it actually suggests a possible future, for example, where um, at least some curators and acquisitions folk become important for their ability to accurately spot talent early mm -hmm. and then to make the connections. Um, you certainly see a class of curators in museums who are prized for those exactly those kinds of capabilities um, in modern art, um, uh, mm -hmm. to recognize important emerging artists and build relationships with them. Uh, but we don't see that in, um, uh, in archives and special collections much for sort of emerging intellectual or cultural figures. Mm -hmm. We tend to get them much later. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's going to be a kind of a new and interesting role. And then one can imagine, you know, sort of interesting second-order effects here. For instance, um, you know, if you actually are a, um important up-and-coming person, um, you know, you go around, you have bragging rights because you have a really high-class library that's already built up, set up a relationship with you, and you're mm -hmm. only 25. Uh, so, you know, that's and I don't way to tell know if you're familiar, if you're familiar with the Living Library Program, I think it's now called the Human Library Program. Yeah. And we just ran one last week. I mean, this takes that to a completely new mm -hmm. place. I mean, you could, it is more like a live, active gallery where you're meeting the artist, meeting the creator, almost living and breathing with them. I mean, it's pretty exciting. It is it's very here. different, and you know when you contrast that kind of an acquisitions activity to mm -hmm. you know, simply running approval plans and mm -hmm. picking stuff off out of catalogs, it takes a very different kind of person and skill set, I think, to be really successful at it. Um, but I think we will see those kinds of people in libraries. Thank you. We're we're we bumped up against the. 2.30, the, the bewitching hour. Uh, well, we've consumed our time. I, I find this, as always, a, a very rich and, and provocative um, uh, few minutes with you. Thank you for making time available for us. And the uh, fellows uh, so uh, 
we'll, we'll anticipate a, a, a successful engagement in Baltimore. We well, I really enjoyed talking with you all, um, and thanks for the great questions. Um, I, I'd say absolutely let's do this again sometime, um, and I do hope I'll be able to welcome a number of you uh, to our upcoming meeting in Baltimore. Um, please stay in touch through CNI Announce um, uh, and uh, through our other mechanisms.